All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome again to another Dog Spot Live. We have a very special guest with us today. Uh, Maria Godavich is with us, but um, let me introduce myself first. I'm Uniti, and I am an, a certified animal assisted therapist and psychologist. I have an initiative by the name of Therapeutic Pause um, that's working towards establishing and um, creating ethical practices in India um, for the field of animal assisted therapy. Now let's talk about our very, very special guest here today. Uh, we have Maya with us and uh, well, this session is not going to be enough for me to tell you about her and her accomplishments. She's a three time New York Times bestselling author and the book that we'll be talking about today, Dr. Dogs is her most recent book. She's been a former USA Today journalist. Um, she's one of the best author experts on working dogs. Um, she has had other New York Times best-selling books like Soldier Dogs, Top Dog, Secret Service Dogs. Um, she's been on a variety of national TV shows, which includes The Daily Show and Today in USA. And she's also talked about working dogs uh, on so many um, large, well-known platforms like the New York Stock Exchange, the National Museum of United States Air Force, and many other notable venues. Well, Maria, for the little time that I've known you, it's just been such an absolute pleasure and it's an honor to be interviewing you today and welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I've really enjoyed our time together before this, uh, getting ready for it. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm in here. I'm here in San Francisco. We're smelling uh, some smoke this morning from all the wildfires burning in California, but we're, we're doing well otherwise. Oh, that's, that's nice to know. Um, well, Maria, let's let's go on and um, speak about your books. The wonderful book that um, I had been reading, Doctor Dogs, covers so many important topics about well, medical dogs, uh, dogs becoming our best friends, turning into our best medicine, and um, how they've been just so wonderfully helpful when it comes to a variety of um, disorders, condi health conditions. Um, we'll be talking a lot about those and um, especially given in the current times of the pandemic, how they've also been helpful with COVID-19. But um, could you tell us a little bit more about your books? Yeah. Oh, well, as you said, my most recent one is the one we'll be talking about. It's Dr. Dogs. And um, it's it's really so relevant right now. But we'll talk. I'll talk about that in a little bit. My other three dogs books have also been about working dogs. The first one was soldier dogs about military working dogs. And then top dog was about one really special marine dog who led more than 400 missions, combat missions, and no one was ever hurt in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, when they were behind her. And then a book about the dogs of the Secret Service. And it's all been about working dogs and the amazing things that they do. I, I have a dog who uh, is sleeping right here right now, and he is not officially a working dog, but um, he actually appeared in Dr. Dogs and my last dog appeared in my book, Soldier Dogs. I like to bring my books, my dogs into my books. So um, I don't know, they can be like the every dog and people can identify and say, hey, could my dog have been a war dog or ha could my dog be a doctor dog? So Gus, actually I think we have a slide of Gus coming up. Um, Gus is, I'll let him sleep right now. So he'll be quiet while we talk. There's Gus. Um, Gus is a yellow lab and he's really sweet, fun, uh, dynamic guy who I actually think could have been or could be still a doctor dog because what doctor dogs need is a great nose. They want to find things and usually they find things for rewards, treats and things, but Gus just finds things. He, I'll be lately because of COVID, my gym is the park or Golden Gate Park or the beach and I'll be doing sit-ups and push-ups and he gets bored. So he'll just go into the bushes and come out. This is just one day, one morning's worth of things, like a half hour's worth of toys wow. that he found. So that's what he's all about is finding. So do those dogs like to find things and they, they get rewarded for them and finding things that they can smell. So that's what these guys do. And actually he is sort of a doctor dog in an unofficial way because he gets me out walking out there, hiking two times a day, rain or shine. Um, he I'm sure brings down my blood pressure when I'm on deadline and I pet him and I can talk to him and tell him the woes of the world if those have befallen me. So uh, dogs, I think everyone's dog is a doctor dog in their own unique way. But today we'll be talking about the more specialized ways dogs are doctor dogs. And um, 
that's because of two things, their noses and the bonds that they have with their people. And um, I think we had something on that too. That's, that's right. So that's that's actually amazing to know. And um, all, all our pets are always so special to us in, you know, in a variety of ways, but it's always amazing to know how they even do it. Um, there are so many wonderful stories you've covered where um, while dogs haven't even been trained to do certain things, but they're able to do it. But um, I think the most prevalent question right now is how exactly um, well, do they do it? Right. Yeah. So um, it is, a, it's, there are so many senses involved. Um, they, they, they can look at body language and many other things, but really it's about the bonds they have. Exactly. Here's a slide with their people and their noses. They're um, in, let's talk about war first. It's the same thing. The, the dogs who are sniffing uh, disease for a living, they're sniffing their person's diabetic lows, for instance, aren't that much different from dogs of war. Uh, the dogs of war have this incredible bond with their person and, um, and they are there, yeah. So they're there leading the way, they're sniffing for bombs and they're telling their person when they find an explosive. And um, if they weren't bonded with their person, they wouldn't really care so much and they, they wouldn't really do their job. And that's uh, what I've been writing about in the past is really similar to what I've written about in doctor dogs, these dogs. Um, this was my dog, uh, my subject of my book, Top Dog. Her name is Luca. And look at the pond she had. Here he is you know, taking fire and she's just taken this upon herself to do this protective stance. She was never trained to do that. And again, it's this, it's a sense of what she did for a living, what doctor's dogs do is uh, they sniff things out that maybe shouldn't be there. And um, we can talk a little about their their sense of smell, which is is incredible. And they employ their sense of smell along with this bond. Oh, um, yeah, this is oh, this is actually kind of fun. We've got this exact nose right here. Uh, <laughs> and um, this was given to me by uh, a researcher at the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. And it's a um, real 3D model of the outside wow. of a dog's nose. This dog had died and, well, not this dog, the dog who modeled this had died and um, was given to science. And they they did an MRI of, and they did the intricate circuitry within the nose, but I got the outside of the nose, which is cool. We all look at our dog's noses and they're cute and they, you know, they they, yeah. they, they touch you, but um, the, the nose leather is what we're talking about here. And there's so much that goes on even outside here. You see the little script, next time you look at your dog, look at the little nose, those little things, little scrolls on the outside. Those play a part. The way they sniff is is amazing. They um, they actually use this kind of um, how dogs sniff on the end of technology that does sort of sniffing of chemicals. And instead of drawing a continuous uh, um, inhale as the machine usually does, they had it sniff as a dog does, which is about five times a second. And then the dog often can blow the air out the side so it doesn't interfere. So when the machinery was doing that, it was 16 times more accurate than um, when it was just inhaling as it would. So we have a lot to learn from a dog's nose. We have um, pretty good, you know, humans have a pretty good sense of smell, but uh, <laughs> it's a cute picture, but um, dogs have a way better sense of smell. They can smell, they, we have like 6 million olfactory receptors and they have 300 million. Their brains are absolutely geared for smelling. They can smell a teaspoon. I know this is a weird thing, but it's the only, these are the only um, images of Olympic swimming pools that I could find. Um, and so they can smell the equivalent of a teaspoon of a substance in two Olympic swimming pools of, of material or what. And so they, they really trump us and, um, in this in the sense of smell world and their their sense of smell is really rich and vivid kind of like our sense of sight so um actually a scientist uh, cindy otto who i write about in my book at university of pennsylvania likes to say that dogs can sniff in color and that really i love that because it talks about how how really vivid and important and vital their sense of smell is if your dog is always stopping on walks to smell things. Um, it's not that they're being annoying or just ridiculous. They're reading a lot with their nose. It's uh, they call it pee mail here anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's how dogs generally do their work as doctor dogs. 
That's wonderful to know. It's very interesting to know how um, they have these special receptors, which uh, when you compare it to how, how uh, the, the, that they're spelling in color and uh, you compare it to human vision, I think that's really interesting to understand about how they actually do it. So that's amazing. And, and for you to be able to come across so many people who've done such good work with medical dogs and a lot of research that's going on, um, I believe you've traveled worldwide, you've traveled across parts of US, Europe, Asia. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, all of your travels and how you've come across um, all of these wonderful people that you've written about? Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, I, yeah, I was lucky enough to get to travel around the world. It was a great excuse to see places that I wanted to see that happened to have incredible working dogs. Um, oh, yes, I jetted around the world. <laughs> and I, um, some of, uh, I, I would have liked to have gone to more places, but um, I, the places I went to, I really got deeply involved with the dogs. Um, and there's a, I think there's a slide coming up of me in Japan with a sniffer dog. And that was a, there are dogs in Japan who are sniffing. There's one sniff. That's me with that's not, that's not my dog Gus. So they kind of look alike throughout the world. And then um, I spoke English to this dog and it was just fine. Um, in rural Japan, they have a very high rate of stomach cancer in this one region. And the doctor is trying, a researcher is trying to find out why not really why but trying to find out if there's a way to non-invasively and rapidly screen um, a whole village and so a whole village was participating in in this study um, and I, I was there while that was going on it was absolutely beautiful yeah and I went all over Europe and um, and some other places all over all over the United States I would have loved to have come to India but in the future I will be going oh yeah and it wasn't always glamorous <laughs> I rode in this is a slide from uh, when I was driving I spent some time in in prisons in West Virginia where they train these dogs, um, they give them 120 commands. The inmates really bond with the dogs and it's really hard for the inmates when the, um, the dogs leave, but they uh, train the dogs on all these commands and the dogs go back to, we drove through the Appalachian Mountains down to North Carolina. It was about a 10 hour drive with a dozen dogs and it was pretty smelly, but it was freezing cold. And this one dog kept escaping from the back and becoming my scarf. Uh, so um, there are all kinds of adventures I had. And I, I mean, I was just so touched by the way the bonds with the people and their dogs are so incredibly important and so deep and how the dogs throughout the world are working with their people to save lives every day. That's and the amazing. science, and I, the science is great too. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's amazing how um, you've so uh, beautifully and captured all of your travels into the book as well. Um, mm -hmm. I was just um, thinking about it earlier and speaking to the dogs for team about how um, I always require a certain amount of science to believe things, and I'm I'm not usually easily uh, humored when I'm I'm reading a book. But your book, it was such a beautiful mix, a blend of the science that is much required to understand all the concepts. So you're, you're given the evidence behind everything you've written about the beautiful emotional stories. I mean, we'll be discussing some of them today, but some of them are just so touching and all of that mixed with um, mixed with so much humor. I mean, your style of writing is just amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. It's coming from a scientist, especially. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, well, I was reading your book, I found a very interesting part in it, which um, spoke about how it all started, especially with um, the cancer detection. And uh, we have this beautiful story of baby Boo, who's the daughter <laughs> of a border college dog, Frisky Fru. <laughs> so um, we have uh, the story of baby Boo and how um, a lot of times people feel that, you know, we, we force our, we're forcing the dogs to work and that's something that doesn't come naturally to them. But this story just shows how um, they love working and how that this this sense of smell is something which is so natural to them. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, well, Baby Boo and how it all started? I would love to. Um, uh, that's not that, that is not Baby Boo, but I think we'll be seeing Baby Boo shortly. <laughs> Baby Boo, there she is. Isn't she so cute? So she is. A, she was a rescue dog, and she lived with a couple of other rescue dogs in a house on the outs on the leafy outskirts of London. And she took care of the other dogs. She was so sweet with them, and she was terribly, beautifully uh, tender with her people, with with her owners. And uh, one day, 
baby boo out of the blue uh, was in the garden with her person while her person was working on the side of the house. And she completely uncharacteristically started attacking the back of this woman's leg. And, and the woman had no, Bonita Whitfield had no idea what was going on. Um, I actually, this story has never really been told. I, I was able to find this woman so many years later. Um, it turns out, long story short, as you might guess, that she had um, what would prove to be a malignant, a, a melanoma, um, it's a bad cancer, on the back of her leg. And um, if Baby Boo hadn't told her about it in time, the doctor said she probably would have spread and she may not have made it. So Baby Boo saved her life. But the key about Baby Boo, which and Baby Boo did that on her own, there was something amiss, something didn't seem right. She did that on her own. But the key about her was that there happened to be a doctor, Hywell Williams, who happened to be looking through the records of that hospital. And he came across that case. And he uh, he saw that it was marked in, in red. It said, dog saves woman's life or something. And so he checked into it. He met with her. And then he ended up writing a short letter to the editor of the very prestigious journal, British um, medical journal called Lancet. And it was the first time that a dog had ever been mentioned as a potential for sniffing out cancer. I think the title was yeah. Cancer Dogs in the Melanoma Clinic or something. And um, and that was the, the first time everyone refers to that incident because it's the first time it was 1989. It was actually that article appeared on April Fool's Day. So I think people may have thought, what? Uh, because it was so, such a foreign idea at the time. But Baby Boo sort of started this whole thing of people wondering, can dogs do this? And it took a long time for science to go, you know, it, was, it wasn't until a decade later or so that really more serious studies would start. But now it's really, it's going crazy. So yes, dogs can naturally do this. There are a lot of cases I ran across where people said, my dog sniffed out my breast cancer or my my skin cancer, my lung cancer, because they were doing, they were poking at me and acting weird and I decided to get tested. So, I mean, sometimes dogs poke and act weird just for, just for fun. But so you have to, you know, kind of take it with a grain of salt sometimes, but maybe it pays to listen to your dog as well. It did for Benita Whitfield. And then lots of dogs are trained to do what some of those dogs do naturally. They do it very, very, very well, and they love what they do. So baby boo, thank you. That, that's wonderful to know. And um, there have been so many interesting stories about uh, how these dogs have worked and um, helped so many individuals with these medical conditions. Um, one Another story that I'm um, a big fan of, well, uh, is the story of Leslie and Bud and how, uh, well, the little angels uh, service dogs have uh, helped uh, Leslie get Bud. Um, however, even after the training on the first night itself, Bud was able to alert Leslie about the seizure. So uh, what was that experience like? And Oh, yeah, it was she this dog had been trained this the woman is in northern california the dog was being trained in southern california on samples of her sweat and her saliva um, as she was coming out of a seizure so the dog was supposedly going to be able to identify this and the dog when the dog would smell these things the dog bud was eventually trained to smell it get uh, get a little package that to bring to her with her medicines, press a life alert button, basically call 911 or her husband or whatever, and then come back to her um, after warning. Oh, first thing he does is warn her. But, um, and he does this exquisitely. And the first time, the first week that he met her, she, uh, she had a seizure. She was going to have a seizure. She didn't know it. He did his alert. He, he, he went up to her and he actually sat and he started pawing and pawing and pawing, pawing. That was his signal. And sure enough, she had a seizure and everybody cried um, because they, it was, they were still in training. And the dog had recognized this from those months of smelling this, he could tell. And since then, I mean, I've, I spent time with them up in Santa Rosa. Since then, he's been saving her life on a daily basis. She could be out walking and collapse and go into a seizure. He will tell her ahead of time so at least she can get to a safe spot. So he's such a good dog and he loves what he does. These dogs truly, truly embrace the job if they choose the right ones. 
And that's amazing. Um, in a lot of conditions, especially like this one, where um, there are there are serious um, well uh, consequences of a person getting a seizure and falling down. Some of them hurt themselves quite badly, and if they get to know yeah. that beforehand, it, it's very interesting. In fact, um, well, having a little bit of a background in neuropsychology myself, I know that. We, we haven't been able to come up with uh, very reliable devices per se who, that can you know point out to us when um, a seizure is about to occur. It's, we don't have very reliable devices, and if dogs can help us oh, with yeah. that, then that's that's a oh yeah yeah cool. dogs and some dogs do a lot of dogs do that on their own. Um, in mm -hmm. fact, until recently, um, very, most of the um, the foundations around epilepsy and seizure disorders have said, no, dogs cannot be trained on this. They have to just mm -hmm. do it naturally. And usually what a dog would do, a pet of someone would do is they would sense it and they would start getting nervous and whining. And that's what their people would go, oh, you know, Fido is, is looking at me and getting nervous. I maybe I'm gonna have a seizure and they start putting that together, but dogs can indeed be trained on this. That's wonderful. In fact, um, there have been parts in your book where you've covered that Sometimes human doctors can make mistakes, but our doctor dogs have uh, proven to step in and, you know, not make that mistake. <laughs> yes. Let's, let's move on to that one about uh, where, we, where you talk about, uh, just a second, I'll put it up right here. Yeah. There you go. About Paul and Koira. And, um, oh, well, it's, it's actually a very, very sad story about Paul and how he's, Poor boy has had his has gone through so much. He had the connective tissue disorder, which uh, you know then later on the paralysis, and they thought it was because of his migraines. But um, it, it it must have been a very heart wrenching experience for you as well to, to oh understand to, about. to hear this. And his story is so incredibly complex. And to hear about what he had to go through and his family, it just I my heart broke for them. And yet their dog gave them everything their their dog just was is so lovable her name is Koira look at her you could just snuggle her all day but they got her this is a really unusual story and this is not how it's typically done they got her when she was a puppy to train her they worked with um someone who trains dogs helps people train their own dogs um, service dogs academy i think it was called and the woman would tell them how to train their puppy with his scent of no one knew why he was going into paralysis and the doctor he would just drop he would just drop it sometimes he wouldn't he would stop breathing um and the doctors were saying well it's probably migraines that's all they could say. So they thought, okay, this woman has trained dogs on migraines. Let's get her to help us. And so they would take, again, kind of like the seizure dog I talked about, they would take uh, samples. He would spit into a piece of gauze and um, I think they do a sweat wipe as well, a skin wipe. And every half hour they would do that until he had a paralysis attack. Then they would take the one that was closest to the attack and um, or his paralysis and train the dog on that by putting it under the puppy's food. The puppy would get her food when she signaled to it, when she recognized it, eventually she, um, I'll skip a whole big bit of training, but she was able to train so that she could sniff this out before he would go into paralysis. And he also had this other horrible manifestation, which was dystonia, which is where his, you know, if you've ever had a Charlie horse, imagine having those all over your body. Um, and with his Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, where he has connective tissue disorder, he would throw out his, his joints would all pop out of joint. And so it was a mess, but she could tell him, they trained her on that as well. She could tell all these things. And it didn't matter to Koira that, no, eventually they found out that his brainstem was being crushed by, um, his connective tissue disorder, and he's had a couple of surgeries, so he's gotten much better. It didn't matter that she didn't know the diagnosis. She knew the scent, and that's what counted. That's wonderful. Yeah. And, um, it's, it's great oh. how even... All right, yeah, please oh. go ahead and tell about Paul, that. <laughs> even, sorry, Paul, even though he had, like, his hands are so problematic even now that he, he just... Um, is they're always, his fingers are always coming out of joint. He does this, I, I just happened to wear this today, I realized he does this beautiful jewelry making, uh, he has a shop on Etsy. So uh, he does this by hand intricately. Um, so I just, I, I, he's such a, he's a really strong guy and he's, he's back in college now and, um, and Koya helped get him there. So anyway, sorry. 
You know, that's absolutely all right. And that's beautiful. And, uh, and you said that's made by Paul, right? Paul, made by Paul, by him. That's what he does. So if anyone you know, wants some of his jewelry, it's very affordable. And he does it He does it with heart. And it's beautiful. He'll cater to it. So let me know and I'll send it to him. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, we, we have, um, well, the next condition that we, wa uh, we wanted to really discuss today was um, diabetes. And that's, that's quite a prevalent condition and um, something that people need to be more aware about of how uh, medical dogs or our doctor dogs can step in and really help us when it comes to diabetes. Well, this is Luke and um, he was diagnosed at a very, very young age. I believe he was only about two years old when he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Yeah. And um, well, Jedi uh, completely changed his life for him, didn't he? And uh, why, why don't you tell us a little bit more about Sure. Luke? And this is another unusual case. Usually children don't get these dogs. Um, they're reserved for adults because it does take a lot of training and a lot to work with them. But the mom stepped in and said, look, I will be the proxy. So um, typically what these dogs do, and this dog does as well, Jedi, Jedi, I, I, for two-year-old, um, the two-year-old wouldn't recognize that this is the alert that Jedi gives for when he will have a diabetic low or high. Um, most diabetic alert dogs, and there are many in the US, they're a growing number really around the world, and they do this job so exquisitely, they're able to sniff out when someone is going into low or high blood sugar. Now they really reserve these for type one diabetics where it's extremely important. And they can do this somehow and nobody knows how, um, what they're sniffing, but they can do this typically in real time. Whereas monitors um, monitor blood in a different way, monitor this in a different way. And they're usually 10 or 15 minutes behind. Dogs do it in real time before the before someone's going to really have problems. So um, they are able to do this, they, that that dog will sit um, and pick up the brinzel. He usually dogs will wear a brinzel, or sometimes with Luke, his mom would wear one, and the the dog would grab it. Luke could be outside playing on a trampoline, and the dog could be inside, and the dog will alert, and then the mom checks, and sure enough, um, he's he's going down fast. And and I just find that so amazing, especially since we don't know what it is in most cases almost all cases, we don't know what it is the dogs are sniffing. And so science is working to find out what is this compound? What are these combinations of compounds? The dog knows, but they can't tell us. Not yet. That, that's amazing to know. So you're saying that uh, the way that these dogs alert the humans is with the brinsel? Yeah, so the brinsel, yeah, so the brinsel is, um, that at least the diabetic alert dogs use these. It's um, usually, they usually, it's usually smaller than that, and it's attached to the dog's collar, and the dog will reach down and pick it up and sit and stare at the person. So there's no, you know, a lot of dogs will sit and stare or paw as an alert, but with diabetic alert dogs, they want to make sure that the person really gets it. And so it's a thing with them to do this. Um, and it really gets your attention. And with this dog, again, if the parent has the brinsel, um, but he's, Luke has started using when he's going to school with his dog now. So that's working great. But what some dogs do, and and uh, Jedi does this, is the brinsel happens and then you could say, is it a low or a high? And so if it's a low, a diabetic low, the dog will get into a downward dog, you know, the yoga pose sort of like they'll oh, yeah. stretch and it'll be low. And if it's a high, they do a high five with their paw. Now, not all dogs are trained on that. It's not necessarily necessary, but it's a very cute add on, especially, you know, when with a child. So I watched that, um, the group that did this in Southern California and the dogs are amazing. And they go on these outings together, uh, uh, people with the diabetic alert dogs and uh, because they want to have them ready for any situation, not just a quiet situation at home, they have to be ready for anything. And they are, I cannot believe how well these dogs are trained. now. Um, well, I can get into this later maybe, but you have to be careful where you get a dog and do your homework because not all dog trainers are created equally and there are even some who are out just to get money. So please do diligence um, for anyone looking to get one of these dogs. But there are, there are more and more really, really great dogs out there and, and really well trained. That, that's something that I guess is very important to uh, be spoken about. I guess in um, Luke's story itself, you had mentioned that the first dog that they had come across um, cost somewhere around $22,000, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, and okay, and it is understandable. These places can, um, they put a lot of money into the dogs and some places that create really, really good dogs, give them away for free because they have funding been behind the scenes. Some places 
can charge like $25,000. And yeah, they had just, they, there was an organization that turned out to be um, reportedly one of the ones that wasn't training dogs well and the dogs weren't hitting the alerts and um, they're putting them out there as these perfect dogs. No dog, no dog is perfect. So um, I don't really, uh, that no one should say that dogs will hit that every time, but uh, they, they just missed that and they paid much less and they've got this hero dog still to this day. And um, he loves, loves, loves what he does. Um, Jedi, like so many of these dogs are so excited. And so they just live for their work. I think they know how important, oh yeah, um, this is a, this guy is a local Troy, Troy boy. He lives in the San Francisco Bay area and I get to meet him and his mom, Kim Denton. Um, they, there wasn't enough room in the book for everybody, but look at this dog. It, he knows, they start out working for treats and rewards, but they end up um, doing this because they know how important it is and they get so much praise. And I was with them and he had this, um, she was apparently, she didn't know she was having a, a going into a low and he just takes, and look how earnest he looks. He's just looking at her mm -hmm. like, come on, come on. And yet, you know, in other times he is so much fun and exuberant and loves everything, but he will stop and be like, come on, listen to me. You got to take care of yourself. Let's do this. Let's go get some insulin. Um, so yeah, they, they really, the, dogs love to work. And when a dog has work like this, that's so meaningful that they can know it's so meaningful. It's just, it, it becomes their life and it's it's not work. It's what, it's just what they do. And they still get to cut loose. All these dogs get to have, you know, loads of fun as well as the enjoyment they seem to get from their jobs. Yeah, it's, it's been really nice to see how, um, along with, of course, the noses and bonds that you discussed, they have these uh, receptors that are so much more, far more superior. Um, they have these amazing bonds with their humans and how all of it just comes so innately to them, so naturally to them, and they enjoy the entire process. And it's 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 not work in the um, technical sense for them. They, they enjoy doing it, whatever, yes. the, whatever the task that they're involved with. Yeah, if only people could enjoy their work as much as these dogs <laughs> would enjoy their work. That's true. So, um, well, uh, you've spoken about a lot of um, these disorders where the, the samples are taken and the dogs are trained. So either the salivary samples or um, the gauze that collects some kind of fluid from the humans to help train the dogs to be able to uh, detect such conditions. But um, what's also wonderful is that they can uh, detect emotional conditions as well, right? Yes, which is really, really amazing to me. And um, uh, I found out through my research that there has been research done um, on uh, dogs and if they can smell what we call emotions. And most of the research I found was taking place in Italy um, and they're, they're finding that dogs can, and I've read several studies that they can differentiate between different emotions, uh, particularly they're looking at, well, this slide is actually, there's a researcher in Indiana who trains dogs on for seizures and I think one of them is diabetes, but also she uh, trains dogs for people with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD or PTS, I think they're calling it now. And so they she will take samples of the saliva or sweat from people who are in ang uh, who are experiencing anger or panic, anxiety, and she will take that to supplement what she has the dogs do. For them and dogs can really really help mitigate this. I think we'll talk about that a little later but um, the dogs don't need the scent training for that but it can be immensely helpful if they can um, be trained on that on their own. I think a lot of dogs just learn hey you know there's body language that's showing me something's going to hit the fan and then um, oh yeah I smell this scent that um, I know let me get over here and start to work on getting this person calmer or in a, in a safer place before this happens. So yeah, it, dogs can smell emotions and they are being employed to do so more and more often these days. Um, and they're service dogs, bona fide service dogs. These aren't um, emotional support animals, although they can be really helpful as well. These are trained dogs, you know, trained uh, as service dogs to mitigate that. Uh, we have, uh, in my book, I have a whole, section on on this phenomenon which is really growing yes you, in your book i came across this really uh well interesting case of kit and angus and um angus gets to smell some really 
uh, well, the stuff that he gets compensated for well is what <laughs> yeah. you've mentioned. Um, and um, he, he he's able to help uh, it with her anxiety. And that's quite yeah. amazing. That's quite saying something. Yes, yes, absolutely. Oh, you know what? I just noticed my, my computer is unplugged and I'm down to 27%. Back. Hang on yeah. just a sec. I have to make sure this gets plugged in. We don't want to. There. Okay. Uh, sorry about that, guys. Okay. So, um, yeah, Kit has uh, really severe debilitating anxiety, and um, it ca she she goes to she goes to school. Sorry, she goes to college in. Um, sorry, are you hearing that going yeah. on and off? Okay, she'll be okay now. It's very picky today. Um, she goes to college in Arizona. And um, he is able to go to classes with her. And here I, I was with them at the university bookshop. And if she has a, if she, if she, he can sometimes sense a panic attack coming on and he will start to do his um, soothing behaviors with her, come up in, and, um, and calm her by just leaning into her or cuddling with her. Um, but she's, he's trained also to lead her out of any situation. If she says leave or exit, he, is really good at finding how to get out of a place because at some point she may not be able to. And so he's been trained to kind of watch where they come from and go and get her out of these situations, um, which is, it's becoming a more common job because anxiety unfortunately is really prevalent these days. And it's so heartening to see people getting their lives back, people being able to go back to work, to go to school once they have one of these service dogs who can really mitigate the issues. That's, that's wonderful. And a lot of times these issues that people have, these disorders or conditions, um, they tend to be treatment resistant. So a lot of times people, um, they receive medications for it, they visit psychiatrists or they try talk therapy. And it, it, it's what the name says, it's treatment resistant. Um, it, it doesn't get better no matter how much they try to, uh, how many medications they try to consume or the kind of therapies they go for. And mm -hmm. well, it's now um, becoming a well-known fact that these are junk therapies and uh, are, are proving to be more helpful. Uh, you, ha you have this beautiful case of uh, Will, um, let me just put it up here, and um, how he had a treatment-resistant uh, PTSD, so he was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, and um, well, he, he tried a lot of things out, right, and he was just not able to feel himself and get better. Um, how did Harnett? Yeah, yeah, and Will had done two uh, deployments to Iraq where he saw some pretty rough stuff, and he came back and um, his life fell apart. His marriage was falling apart. His family life, um, his he was drinking and doing a lot of things that he shouldn't have been doing, and he couldn't find himself. He he got treatment. He the the Veterans Administration gave him all kinds of medicines, and that just numbed him, um, and and he didn't want to live numb. And someone uh, told him about service dogs. And he happens to live in North Carolina near an excellent service dog agency that creates dogs for people with PTSD. And he was able to get this dog, Harnett, who was trained in the prisons, actually. That picture of me coming back from the prisons with the dog around right. my shoulders, that was one of the dogs that they bring down from the prison. So it's such a win-win because the prisoners have something to do that makes their lives more meaningful and then and they know they're helping others and will is just one of the people they help as soon as he they met they bonded and they harnett is responsible for giving him and his family their life back they harnett um will's wife says that harnett is is his second wife because like harnett is there all the time and um harnett knows commands like um just I, uh, he knows how to get him out of different situations, but also um, if he if he uh, has anxiety, he'll say something and and he'll he'll really he'll lean up against him. But his favorite one, and he knows 120 commands, okay. But Will's favorite command, and probably Harnett's, is cuddle. Uh, you know, it's a, it's kind of hard for a better a tough veteran to say cuddle in front of people, so he whispers it, and it just and he comes in for a cuddle and snuggle and that just takes him, that grounds him, and that brings him right back. So they're, and they are so cute together. They they love each other so, so much. And so really a dog was responsible for giving a man and his family their lives back. And that's that happens across the board. So um, in the US, the Veterans Administration is doing 
well, having research done to see if the dogs are good enough so that maybe they can be offered as for free um, if they get if someone gets prescribed a dog, because right now it can be challenging. There are a lot of organizations doing good work giving veterans these dogs, but there are a lot more veterans that need these dogs than are able to get them. So maybe that will happen in the near future, actually. Well, it, was, it was really nice to see how Hanet just turned Will's um, life around and uh, well, like you said, very right said, gave him his life back and he was able to uh, be, be himself again and be with his family. Um, but what's very interesting to also see is that dogs don't only really help with PTSD in humans, they can also help with PTSD in other dogs. Not many people know that even dogs can suffer from um, well, post-traumatic stress and um, You've, you've had a lovely story about uh, Daisy and Oprah where um, Daisy suffered from PTSD, right? And she had her little protege right there. Yeah, see, I love this picture so much. Um, and I, in, the, in the book, I talk about their person, Judy, who suffered from PTSD. And um, again, nothing was working. And she, could, she ended up getting Daisy and Daisy was her everything. Daisy changed her life, but they were in a car accident and it was pretty traumatic and Daisy stopped working. She stopped, she, she would try to work, but she would, anytime she'd go out, she'd be shaking and she, um, she was never the same after that. And no matter what they tried to do, she would get calmer, but she wasn't good at working. So um, they got this other dog, Oprah, who they were hoping would train as, with the same organization, actually had this dog and sure enough, and they're, they're super bonded as you can tell, sure enough, mm -hmm. Oprah has taken over and, Oprah helps Daisy too. Daisy sometimes finds Oprah a little annoying just because she's still you know, way younger, um, but they're great friends and they live with Judy. Um, and so Oprah has taken over as her um, PTSD, PTS service dog. And so, yeah, and dogs can get PTSD. In fact, I write a lot about that in one of my previous books, Soldier Dogs. They didn't realize this. Um, the some dogs are more prone to it um, in war. So like the Labrador retrievers they sent to war were the ones who would typically end up, um, not not all of them, there, there goes mine, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with PTSD rather than say the Belgian Malinois or the German Shepherds, but any dog can can get this. But yeah, I love that story. I love that picture. They're, yeah, they're, it was, they're it was just such a touching story of how, uh, how Daisy meets with that accident and after that, she's just not herself and not able to be there for Judy the way um, she used to be earlier when, when Judy was well suffering and recovering from PTSD. And it, it's wonderful to see how Oprah could step in and not only learn from Daisy, but also be her, you know, the her service dog. Right <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And she did learn a lot from Daisy. Uh, it, it was it, that animals do that. They can learn from each other. And I think that should be used more in in training, uh, actually. But um, and they're starting to do that more. But yeah, that's a it's a lovely story. And um, and Judy is doing really well. She's got both dogs now. So so life is a lot better. That's wonderful. Um, we also you've also gone on to write very beautifully about um, how service talks can be incorporated with children as well. Um, you've covered some stories on autism and uh, well, here is Ira and Bob. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about how service talks can be of um, help to children and especially that are on the spectrum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, particularly, I talk about the spectrum. Um, and I have a couple of children I, I wrote about in the book. And I happen to be in Croatia, in Zagreb, Croatia, doing research on the book and uh, with this organization. And on this day, they were going to be giving Bob to this sweet, wonderful girl named Ira. And I asked, could I possibly go along to see this? And I was so happy to be there. Uh, the, the trainer, is, it's hard for the trainer to part with the dogs. He actually lives with the dogs um, that he trains. So, but he was so happy to see the family. And I was thrilled to see how that everyone came to tears when they saw Bob and Bob just fit right in. He just went and he, he just started calming Ira right away. So what autism spectrum dogs do typically is they are trained on how to calm uh, anxiety when it's happening, before it's happening. They can, they can see the signs. They're there as a steady rock for the child and they are um, extremely good at what they do. They have to have a certain temperament for certain children. Ira, um, has a calmer manifestation of her autism spectrum. Some children um, have, uh, they, they'll have um, more difficulties in public places where 
um, a dog really has to work to keep a child from running or, um, or to really calm the child down. And I wrote about a, a, a family in the American Midwest whose dog came in and absolutely changed their life. They could not go to any restaurants. They, everything was takeout. Uh, their, their child would um, just have really big difficulties in school. And yes, um, and, um, and it was, life was so hard for the child and for the family. And they tried to get a dog for four years. That's how long these lists are. And they got a dog, just a pet dog thinking maybe that would help, but it didn't help. In fact, it, um, the dog started being scared of loud noises as the child had been and would bolt. And so that was kind of a disaster. They got Lloyd and um, Lloyd changed their lives. Now, these days, they're going on, well, before COVID, they were on planes traveling all over the US. Um, they go to restaurants, um, the boy and his dog get their own table. It is absolutely life-changing. And the that these dogs are, they're so devoted to their jobs. And they, again, they know it, watching them in action, they know what they're doing and they love, they have such a deep bond with the person with whom they're working. Um, so yeah, autism spectrum, disorder dogs are sort of rare, but they're becoming more common. And I would love to see this um, happen more and more. And one of the concerns sometimes is about the safety of the dog, like tethering a dog to a child so they don't bolt. There are, there are things that um, need to be looked at and examined and avoided uh, sometimes, but uh, the, the world is coming around to best practices that are good for the dog and for the child involved. That's, that's amazing. And, and you, you've always made a clear distinction between uh, well, dogs uh, who are with their humans, who work with the humans, and um, dogs that are primarily researcher dogs. So um, what exactly is the difference between these dogs that work in, as researchers and the ones that, work, that, that you've been speaking about as of now, about the ones that are with humans? Right. Okay. So the ones I've been speaking about work directly with their, they're, they're like a personal doctor who goes everywhere with them. Um, but these dogs, uh, I call them researcher dogs, uh, they could, they're like, PhDs in the medical world, like you, uh, <laughs> they are. Uh, they work in science. They work in laboratories, uh, really good scientific places all over the world. And uh, lest you think that they are dogs like beagles kept in cages all day, uh, they are not. I know you know that because you've read my book. But mm -hmm. these researcher dogs typically are dogs who uh, or are volunteered for the day by their people and they go in for the day or for a morning and they come back home or in England at Medical Detection Dogs, which is one of the world's top biodetection uh, organizations, they are foster dogs who are being fostered by people and eventually will go to homes and they learn so much. And so these dogs come in and they work and they do their thing and they go home, generally speaking. Um, and they are amazing. So dogs in these settings, um, my big thing that I love talking about is how they can sniff out cancer, but to get other things out of the way, they're trained to sniff out um, some different types of bacteria, some viruses. They've been able to smell. Um, they've been able to smell malaria on socks of children in Africa. Um, that at first, they, it's really hard. It's not like oh, go smell malaria. Oh, here it is. They don't know what they're smelling. So in the case of malaria, the dogs were sniffing out the difference, which was. They were collected from two schools, children in two schools. So um, children in school A and children in school B, and that's how the dogs were separating them. So they had to figure out how to not let that distinction happen. And so they were able to actually train them and they eventually were able to say, yeah, who has malaria and who doesn't. So that could be used one day actually to at checkpoints maybe uh, as people come into airports. But uh, the thing that I uh, really, I'm, amazed by is that dogs can sniff out cancer and I'm not talking in tumors so what that photo that you were showing was a dog at the University of Pennsylvania and that dog was sniffing out uh, ovarian cancer and the dogs sniff, I believe this was from plasma from a woman who had ovarian cancer the dogs amazingly while I was there it's not like oh yeah here's a, a cup of plasma you know, does this have it they were sniff. They were able to sniff it out in one drop of plasma. Actually, in a half a drop, they would take the drop of plasma and mix it with a drop of saline, and then take one drop from that. And the dog could differentiate that from 
uh, blood or plasma from say a woman with a benign ovarian tumor and then other distractors. That thing that you saw is a, a scent carousel and the dog walks around it and we'll see that in a minute how that works. So um, dogs are able, I unfortunately have um, in my family, there seems to be a history of ovarian cancer. My mom died of it. Um, and there are others in the family and there it's not early treatment. There's no early, there's no early detection. There's no good gold standard. And um, Cindy Otto, who I mentioned earlier at the University of Pennsylvania, where this work is being done, she said dogs are the gold standard. They, they will be, um, and they can sniff it out in stage one. They can do it really early. Now you're not going to see dogs doing this in your laboratory. Uh, we'll probably talk about, the, they're going to hopefully lead to a technology because we don't know what they're smelling. We don't know what it is. And once science can discover what it is that they're smelling, they are hoping to, uh, the volatile organic compounds, which the combinations, they are hoping to develop a device that can be used inexpensively, rapidly to determine and, and accurately to determine early cancers. And there are huge numbers of cancers that dogs have been able to detect. Probably they can detect any cancer if given the right circumstances. And science is getting better and better at, um, at how to do this so it's uh, so the, like at first a person was in the room and dogs always look to people uh, to say, hey, is this it? So they had to get the person behind the screen or out of the room. I think we have a slide or a little video that shows uh, yeah. how that's done. So can that's true. And I, I think it's, it's just so fascinating to uh, see that dogs are helping science in a way that we don't know what this chemical is that the dogs are being able to sniff out. And once we are able to recognize these, well, volatile organic compounds or VOCs um, that we get that we understand from these dogs, it's just so fascinating to know that you can create science can then eventually uh, help use those VOCs to create these devices that will um, notify us about these conditions and oh, well, that would mean that the dogs lose their job, right? <laughs> yeah, the dogs will have plenty of other work to do. Um, but yeah, the science is directly working at, at laboratories around the world with the dogs to, to find out, hey, are these the compounds that you're sniffing? Or is this it? And then they'll give that portion of the scent to the dog and the dog doesn't react. And they're like, oh, shoot. So one of these days, they're using GCMS and other technologies to find out what the dogs are smelling. And hopefully we will be able to have this technology used for us and we won't see these dogs but they'll be out of jobs but there will be a lot of other <laughs> things for them to do so yeah that that is a, a one example of a scent carousel and again the dogs um work for reward they they are not slaving away here they love what they do they have to be as i said earlier they have to be driven by uh wanting the, the treat the reward so here's uh, i think we'll we'll show um the video a quick video now this was in in England. Oops, sorry, just a second. There you go. Yeah, so I, I took this um, when I was in England and the dog was going around the scent wheel. Um, oh, it's kind of herky jerky, but. This is smooth in real life. Um, so the dog just trots around the scent wheel. In this case, actually, the dog was looking for uh, a bacteria that can be really harmful to, to vulnerable populations. And you know, it's hard to see here, but the dog sits, and I don't know if there's gonna be sound, but the dog gets praised and then the dog gets a treat. So um, yeah, it's treats or toys and the dogs love what they do and they're, they're driven by reward. And I think those dogs don't realize necessarily that they're saving lives, that they're going to be helping someone one day. It's all about the treats and the fun, unlike the ones who work directly with the people the personal doctor dogs, if you will. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there he's going uh, around and around. So, uh, and, uh, his way of indicating that um, the bacteria is present is by sitting down. Yeah, he sits and stares. Different and, dogs. And they keep the handler uh, hidden for some reason. They keep, they keep what? The handler hidden, the handler. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's something called the clever Hans effect. Hans was a dog, uh, I mean a horse, and um, turns out that he could actually read his person's um, tiniest, tiniest microscopic movements by, to do these tricks that he was doing. Um, dogs do the same thing. Dogs are really, 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 really good at seeing our body language as anyone watching this and has a dog knows. Um, so if they, they look to us, even we might take a breath, we might hold our breath if we know, oh, it's in there. And then they'll be like, oh, is it in here? So in order to uh, get that effect gone, 
the human will hide. Humans are often in the other room. Any or anyone who knows where it is um, is not going to be present. Like he didn't know where it was, but someone else knew. And there, there are even rooms. There are setups where um, researchers are in another room, and they, there's a light that goes on, and then the dog gets an automatic treat. So it's it's all really different, and the science is learning a lot because uh, even preparing samples, let's say cancer samples, the person preparing that. You know, our skin drops off all the time, not like in big sloughs, but we shed so much skin, like 50,000 cells of some, like a minute or something. Um, and so the dogs sometimes learn to differentiate between the person who prepared this sample and the person who prepared that sample. So sometimes they'll be doing that. So it, the trick is to get them to learn to really sniff out the substance, which, you know, maybe I made it sound easy. It is not. It takes a long time for a dog to go, oh, that's what you want me to look for. They put that together. It's like finding Waldo without knowing Wal in the books, Waldo, without knowing who Waldo is. And But once they get rewarded for going, oh, um, then they go, oh, that's what I get my reward for. So, um, and it takes it takes a long time. It takes the right dog and the right trainers. And I'm happy to say that there's a lot of good stuff going on around the world with all the right pra best practices we know so far. That's wonderful. And you mentioned it takes the right dog um, along with, of course, the right procedures by the humans also to make sure their skin cells are not falling into those samples. And we, we take care of things from our end. But you mentioned you, it also takes the right dog. So are there some um, some kind of breeds that are more suitable or are there some dogs that are more suitable for this? How does one? Understand? Yeah, a lot of people think, uh, yeah, because you, know, you see in my slides even, it's mostly Labrador retrievers or maybe golden retrievers or German shepherds. Uh, but any dog who is really wanting a reward, wanting that treat, wanting that ball, and who most dogs have a really good sense of smell. And so um, if they can be trained and they're pretty calm, they, they're not super scattered, they do have to have sort of a focus ability, um, they, can, they can do the job. Now, uh, dogs, are being bred for this very purpose um, at University of uh, at Auburn University. They're really hyperbreeding the dogs for the hyperbreeding sounds wrong, but they're really looking at the sense of smell and getting the dogs with the best and breeding them with the best of the best. So they are trying to create the super sniffer dog. But in most cases, for everyday sniffing, uh, a lot of different dogs can do it. And I think we have the slide that we we showed earlier. Uh, okay. Suga, Suga can do it. She okay. is uh, in Washington state on an island off of Washington state in the US and she sniffs out Parkinson's disease on t-shirts. So here she, and she works for Turkey and she's a diva and she always okay. has a tutu on. And I watched her at work and she's so good. I watched all the dogs up there and they, hit it 100% of the time, enthusiastically and with love. Now she does, she does, she's pretty demanding. If she doesn't get her turkey treats immediately, she will start <laughs> yapping. But but um, they're trying to find Parkinson's at its earliest stages. They're trying to find the scent of Parkinson's at the earliest stages. So maybe again, there can be some kind of uh, device or something that science can have um, developed from this. Right now, um, it's in the basic research phase, but they're working with uh, with a chemist as well who can help um, train out the chemicals and to see maybe one day sugar can help mm -hmm. people with Parkinson's, um, you know, get this a diagnosis more early and so that they can start treatment earlier because the earlier the better for this. So yeah, sugar is just a living example of how it doesn't have to be a certain kind of breed even, but they just have to want to work for that treat. Sure. So, so you need a very focused dog, uh, one that can be trained well and easily, and especially if they are um, reward motivated, either food or toy motivated, those those would be the best packs, right? Definitely. Yes, exactly. Exactly. That, that's great. And and then we have this, um, this uh, your, your, your visit at Vancouver Hospital, and um, could you tell us a little bit more about your visit there and yeah, so uh, here's um, here's a different breed of dog than you've seen before, an English Springer Spaniel, and this is Angus. Angus is trained to smell the bacteria C. diff, Clostridium difficile, which is um, can be deadly. It's extremely harmful in vulnerable populations, which hospitals are full of. Um, it causes terrible um, digestive issue issues, shall we say, and it can kill people. Uh, so 
Angus has been trained to sniff out C. diff, which is found in fecal matter. And, but yeah, you might think, hey, wow, this dog gets to sniff out poop for a living. That's not, that's not actually what he, dogs would love that. My dog would really love that because my dog <laughs> likes to roll in it. Uh, in fact, did yesterday in horse poop on our walk. But uh, <laughs> yeah, but, um, but this dog can sniff out, they trained the dog to sniff out pure C. diff. They were able to take, um, to get that scent and I actually smelled it and it is really strong and it is awful and it burns the nose, but when it's mixed with other things, um, you know, it's more, it, it's harder to find. So the dogs, and that program was so successful with the dogs going around the hospital sniffing for it because typically what happens is um, the nurses and hospital staff um, may not be quite paying as much attention. They're, they're so busy and uh, maybe they'd leave a glove on the floor that has this or, or there's something. Uh, when I was there, Angus actually found something. He alerted, he pulled his handler back and the handler was like, oh no, no, that's just the glove. And it turned out, no, it was actually C. diff. So, um, so then the crew comes in with the ultraviolet cleaner and, and zaps it. And C. diff has um, gone down significantly in these hospitals where these dogs were employed in Vancouver. It's partly a function of the dogs being able to tell, but it's also partly that the staff knows that there is this little doctor dog who's going to come sniffing around and tattling on them if there is something amiss. So there, um, the culture has been changed a little bit. In fact, they've changed practices there where they would just wear the same shoes in and out. Now they change shoes so that they can't track things home or into the hospital. And the dogs were part of that change, which seems pretty basic, but that's not, and most hospitals aren't doing that apparently. So the dogs can help change uh, how, how things are uh, act, working in hospitals and save lives by doing that. And again, they love it. Oh, Angus is all about the treat. He is, like, <laughs> he's all about the treat and he's so enthusiastic. So now I think there are about five dogs in Vancouver doing this work. Yeah, that's great. And I think earlier when we were talking about Kit and Angus, um, this is this is the part I was referring to where he get he's made to smell stuff, but at least he gets very well compensated for the work that he's doing. So oh, yeah. um, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So they, they've they've been doing these great jobs and um they're helping humans in so many ways, but I think it's time to discuss their most important job yet. Um <laughs> let's uh, let's talk about our little super dogs and um, how they are helping with um, the pandemic and COVID-19. Yeah, so when I wrote the book, uh, it came out in October of last year. I had no idea. Of course, no one did that this pandemic would be upon us, but I had written about how dogs may be able to one day help um, help keeping pandemics from spreading if, if that ever happened, never dreaming that this would happen. And... Um, that's what's going on now. When I first heard about COVID, I thought, okay, they've got to start getting dogs on this. And um, sure enough, around the world, at some of the best dog training, bio dog training centers around the world and some other places, dogs are being trained. They're first, they have to see if they can smell COVID safely, um, if they can distinguish it. And so there have been these early studies that are showing, yes, they're really good at this. They're like 95% accurate and not not snip, not saying yes to things that aren't COVID and not saying no to things that aren't. So they're really, apparently really, really good at it. So um, that's really hopeful. And the idea isn't really to help supplement testing because testing is pretty good right now at this point. It may be able to help with testing in the future, but it's to have dogs at places like airports where there are a lot of people coming in and out or hospital schools. As we get back to business eventually, maybe dogs can be secondary screeners. And so the dogs are um, actually right now employed for the first place at um, in the UAE at Dubai International Airport. And they are screening people, not directly, but there's a, they, so people who come into this airport have to have a COVID negative test with them within you know a couple of days and they they come in and they have a secondary screening about 10 percent of the passengers will have their underarm swabbed and they have mm -hmm. to wait in another room the dogs are sniffing it and um and then and they are saying that they're 95 percent accurate so far so they are able to stop the people and they if they say yes then the person has to get a quick other kind of test for covid so in that case, if that's all accurate, they train the dogs really fast. So we're waiting to see, you know, if that holds. But 
that's huge news. And there, again, there are places, including University of Pennsylvania, where they're doing the ovarian cancer research, um, that they're doing this. And the dogs are really, really good. And again, they work for rewards. They work for love. And they are keeping them safe. Um, no Dogs can. It's very, very, very rare for dogs to get COVID. But they are, in the training at least, they can keep them very safe. And even in the sniffing, um, there are these things that really separate the dog from the actual, say, the armpit swab. So that's really hopeful. And apparently Gus is getting bored of this. <laughs> He's leaving again. Um, but but yeah, he. I just think that it's amazing that our best friends can maybe help with their most important jobs. They've been in war. They've helped detect cancer. They help with diabetes. They help people stay alive every day. And now the world needs them more than ever. And they may be able to help us get back to normal a little sooner or a little more safely. I hope, you know, it's not a done deal yet. Research continues, but I'm really, really hopeful. Definitely, truly man's best friend, right? I mean, when we need them the most, they're right there to have yes, us. Yes, exactly. So many ways. Yes. That's amazing. And, and well, Maria, this, this has been amazing. I have thoroughly enjoyed your book as well, which I was mentioning really? earlier, has been written so beautifully and um, combines so many aspects of science with the anecdotes as well as um, that little punch of humor that you always have in there. And it's, it's beautiful. It's just a very, very good read. Could you tell our viewers where they could um, access your book from? How do they get their hands on it? Well, it's in bookstores, but who goes to bookstores anymore? Um, it's on Amazon India, apparently. Um, so, and it's called Dr. Dogs. And my website, yeah, mariagadavage.com has other places where you can buy it. And it talks about my other books, which are also available on Amazon or other uh, retail sites online. Absolutely. And in fact, it's also available in India as an audiobook on Audible if oh, yeah. um, those who prefer to listen to it rather than read it. Yeah, it's a good audiobook too. So yeah, it's it's I actually have to finish it. The the, the reader did a really, really good job. That's wonderful. And and are there other um, places they can reach out to you if they want to? Um, your Facebook page, Instagram page? Yeah, yeah. I have a couple of Facebook pages and you can find them on my website. But um, my most recent Facebook page, I just developed it a couple of months ago. It's Dr. Dogs News. And um, that's where I talk about all the latest, especially with COVID research. And my main page is Soldier Dogs uh, on Facebook. And I have Instagram as well, Soldier Dogs. We have 160,000 people on and come join us. It's mostly about military dog stuff. And um, my focus now is a little more on Dr. Dogs, but any working dog I love. And I have Instagram under my name as well, Maria Godavage. So yeah, if you have questions or just uh, have a great story, please let me know. That's amazing, Maria. Thank you so much for being here today you, and um, coming on live with Dogspot. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking with you.